Happy Easter. This morning we begin by centering our our hearts as one. And taking deep breaths together, I invite you to place your hand on your heart as we pray. Holy living God, heartbeat of creation, help us to take this time to center on you. For you made us. You gave us life, and you continue to be with us every moment. Every breath. Every step. Hear this assurance from God. Be still, O heart, you're not alone. Your beat is shared with me. Come now and calm and center here. You are mine, secure and free. If you have a candle at your home with you, I invite you to light it now. And as we light our candles, I invite you to join in singing our opening song of praise, Here I Am to Worship. We've gathered with food to nourish our bodies, even as we nourish our souls together in worship. This is very much what our spiritual ancestors did as they gathered gathered in those early days in houses. They would bring what they had and, and share with each other. It's no wonder that the idea of a potluck is in our Christian DNA. I invite you to 
Pray with me. Holy peace giver, we gather in your name, invited by Jesus, bound together with your spirit, in union with each other, feed our bodies and our spirits with your comforting presence so that we might be your comfort to others. Bless this food and break open our hearts. Bless this drink and pour out your love. Amen. And now I invite you to pick something up off your table if you have it and let us say the one word that is at the heart of the matter in every blessing we do at our tables, repeating after me, grateful. So let us begin to break bread. with whatever you have, whatever you brought. And as we do so, keep our eyes and ears open to God as we listen for how the word is shared. Hear now the scriptures. This week we read a passage from the account of the Acts of the Apostles that is a wonderful encouragement and reminder that death never is the last word. Hear these words. God raised him up. God freed him from death's dreadful grip since it was impossible for death to hang on to him. David says about him, I foresaw that the Lord was always with me because he is at my right hand, I won't be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my body will live in hope because you won't abandon me to the grave nor permit your Holy One to experience decay. You have shown me the paths of life. Your presence will fill me with happiness. The David you heard referenced in this passage is the psalmist. And the quote you'll hear is from the 16th Psalm. You, Lord, are my portion, my cup. You control my destiny. The property lines have fallen beautifully for me. Yes, I have a lovely home. I will bless the Lord who advises me. Even at night I am instructed in the depths of my mind. I will always put the Lord in front of me. I will not stumble because God is on my right side. That's why my heart celebrates and my mood is joyous. Yes, my whole body will rest in safety because you won't abandon my life to the grave. You won't let your faithful follower see the pit. You teach me the way of life. In your presence is total celebration. Beautiful things are always in your right hand. It may feel odd to have moved into this season of Easter, a, a season of celebration in the midst of these difficult times. Perhaps it's an opportunity really to take into consideration that the, at the heart of our Christian faith, we are called to live our lives in the belief that death is not the final word. Christians are Easter people. The tomb becomes the womb of new life. What would we do differently if we really believed that we are loved beyond all endings, but there was nothing to fear? Today we imagine Jesus at our right hand, counseling us throughout our days with these words, peace be with you. This is what he did when he appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. They were in a locked room fearing for their lives. Sound familiar? Let's let Jesus speak these words to us as well. Here is how the story from the Gospel of John goes. It was still the first of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, 
they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As God sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. There were two things that Jesus wanted the disciples to have in the moment of fear. He wanted them to have peace and the Spirit. I guess you could say taking a breather is one way to see what Jesus offered to them. He wanted them to take his breath so that they would feel his Spirit living in them. Let's take a minute and hear the gospel story in another way. Good morning. I have a straw here, and when you have a drink, do you um, slurp it up and then sometimes blow bubbles? Do you sometimes do that? Well, what happens when you blow bubbles? How does that work? Let me try it. Uh-oh. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I made such a mess. Good thing I had this plate here. Now, last Sunday, we did um, a celebration and remembrance of um, Jesus' resurrection. And today, we're going to, the scripture that maybe you just heard was about, um, was about the time when Jesus appeared to his disciples after, his, after the resurrection. And I'm thinking that the, that the disciples were really afraid. And so I'm going to pretend that this grape juice here was all their fears. And the, the fears were, oh, they were so scared. And when Jesus came and he gave them the Holy Spirit, it's like the air that I blew in here took away the, the water well, the, the Holy Spirit that hit the disciples, it took away their fear. It's awesome. Now, they were so afraid because of all the bad things that happened to Jesus. And then the resurrection happened, and they didn't understand that at all. So when Jesus appeared to them and breathed the Holy Spirit on them, it was awesome. Their fear was replaced with something that's much, much better. Now, the same thing happens to us today. Even when something awful, scary, bad things happen to us, we don't need to be filled with fear for these events. Instead, we need to remember this story. We need to remember that we breathe in and the Holy Spirit comes into our, into our hearts. And then we, every breath we take, it, we're inviting God into our lives. And with every breath where we are inviting God into our lives, we're also pushing out the fear, the worry that filled us up. So we're breathing in God and we're breathing out the fears. That's good news for us today. Let's pray. And remember, we're going to, you're going to respond back at your house. We know Jesus is present among us. We know Jesus is present among Amen. us. Even in this very home, even in, in this, this very, very home, home, we will not let fear be louder than love. We will not, not let, let fear be louder, louder than love. love. But with glad hearts and rejoicing souls, but with glad hearts, hearts and rejoicing souls, we will sing God's praise. We will sing God's praise. For we are Easter people. For we are Easter people. Amen. Continuing our gospel story from John chapter 20. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Friends, let's dive into the story of the Gospel of John, chapter 20, which after Jesus' resurrection, when he has shared the good news and, and Mary has come and delivered the good news to the disciples, but they are all hiding, and Thomas is not amongst them. Which raises a question I want to talk about in a minute, and that is why why is Thomas not there? Why isn't he afraid like the other disciples? Because, I mean, all the disciples are hiding because they're terribly afraid of the authorities, the very ones who crucified Jesus. Uh, Hiding in a room out of fear. Sounds kind of familiar, actually, to us, I guess, in a different kind of context. They weren't social distancing because of a virus. No, they were afraid of authorities. They were social distancing, I guess, a very particular kind of social distancing to stay away from those persons who they thought might want to crucify them too. But Thomas isn't there for that beautiful moment of reassurance when Jesus breathes his peace upon them and they recognize that he is risen indeed. To which if we were practicing traditional liturgical practice, I'd say, Christ is risen, and you'd say, He's risen indeed. But they weren't in that kind of mood, apparently. And yet, as we hear this story and we think about this, where was Thomas? Why wasn't, was he not afraid like the other disciples? There's, there are absolutely zero clues in Scripture. There's a lot of speculation, but there are zero clues in Scripture about where Thomas is. When Jesus first appears to the disciples in their hidden, safe place behind locked doors. I guess uh, in modern day thinking, I guess he could have been out looking for toilet paper or hand sanitizer for all we know. Maybe he was just getting groceries or 
And if he might have even been wearing a mask if he was trying to hide his identity. So we really don't know. But what we do know is that he returns. And they tell him, Thomas, you won't believe this. Jesus was right here. He's alive. He's with us. He breathed, breathed on us and blessed us. And he doubts them. He doubts them. Why? Why did he doubt them? I've thought about this a lot of different times. There's a lot of things you could come up with, I suppose, but I think the most powerful possibility for him doubting them is that he could not believe that anybody who'd seen Jesus, the risen Lord, would be hiding behind locked doors. I think that's it. How could you have seen that incredible moment, have that great mountaintop experience with Jesus reigniting your passion for all that he taught you and stay locked behind those safe and secure doors? See, I think Thomas doubts the same way we sometimes doubt. Now, maybe you're saying to yourself, no, we don't doubt, we believe because of all the blessings we've seen in all the people's lives we know and in our own life. Well, if that's true, how do we then think about all the innocents who have died from COVID-19? How do we think about the EMTs, the nurses, the doctors on the front lines, we believe only because of blessings. See, it raises questions. A number of years ago, I, I read of a 16-year-old boy who had AIDS for 12 years. And as he was dying, he hugged his mama and said to her, it's all right. The story really hit me at the time because it made me think, what was gained, God? What was gained in this moment? I mean, we could, I guess, say we learned about AIDS. I also recall back when there were a couple tornadoes hit around Kansas. This is not new news for a lot of us. It's part of our lives. But Two towns in particular that are fairly close to each other. One was... Hayesville and the others Andover. Now, if you recall, when the the tornado hit Andover, it clobbered them. Twenty six people were killed, many were injured, and a newspaper person who remember newspapers? Well, we'll call him a journalist at this point. Uh, went over and interviewed the sheriff at Hayesville, and he said, "God was watching out for us." God was watching out for us. Really? As soon as I heard that, I just thought, what did Andover do? Why wasn't God watching over Andover? Does God kill us to make a point? Would you cut off your son's hand to teach your son a lesson? Would God intentionally let someone's final hours be spent isolated from everyone that they love, cared for by by overwhelmed strangers, simply to die alone. Would God do that? Can we see why Thomas might have doubted his disciple friends? The question it raises for us is, is God a manipulator, a giant puppeteer, arbitrarily choosing one's death and another's miracle? Does God punish for some secret sin that nobody knows about? When we hear those things being told to us, don't we doubt that God acts in those ways? I know I sure doubt it. Bad things happen to wonderful people. And many things are not in our control. Why did just those disciples who were in that space right then at that time receive the blessing? 
And it raises the question, so what does Jesus' life, death, and resurrection tell us? I think it tells us that God is for life, even eternal life. God created a free world with consequences and accidents. No simple answers, only simple faith in God who became the crucified one. God gave up power to be like us, vulnerable and weak, and took a risk because God loves us. I think Thomas doubted because he didn't expect the resurrected Jesus' wounds to be real. He didn't need to touch them, actually, only to see them. He wasn't prepared to see open wounds or scar tissue because he couldn't believe that an all-powerful, distant God would choose to suffer and die just like we suffer and die. Just so we could know his eternal love and presence with us. So Thomas' declaration in this story in chapter 20 is, My God, my God. And the sub subtext in his mind is, How could you choose to do such an awesome act of love? I heard a profound statement shared after a disaster. Christ is always there. It's just that we're looking a little harder right now. As I think it was our first responder to, to a, a serious storm. See, I believe that's where we are today. We're looking a little harder. We've known God's blessing, not because God caused an accident or a disease, but because we experience God's loving presence, Christ's loving presence with us in our suffering. Even then, maybe especially then. Christ's peace, a gift in the midst of turmoil, is when it's most beloved. Just as you have faith in Christ, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you and with you. There is no social distancing from Jesus. Perhaps a modern day interpretation from the Apostle Paul in Romans would be, can anything, cancer, AIDS, heart failure, tornadoes, or accidents separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? I doubt it. Not even COVID-19, not the falling stock market, not massive unemployment, not the challenges that face all of us who are quarantined or forced into social distancing, having to worship in our homes. None of that can separate us from such a great love. In the end, no matter our circumstances, we are not alone. We are not alone. Amen. Friends, I know that it is difficult in this moment not to be near some of the people we love and might be worried about. I invite you to take a moment, if you're comfortable, and say aloud the names of those you wish were right there next to you today at your table. As we name them, they are present with us in our hearts. We invited you, if you were able to have a small rock with you this morning. If you do, grab it now. If not, just imagine you're carrying a small rock in your hand. That's fine. And I want you to take a moment and name a hard, heavy thing that you are carrying with you right now. It could be a worry about a loved one, fear of getting sick, loneliness without seeing friends, difficulty with school or work at a distance. Consider those things. I also invite you to call to mind those who may be carrying heavy, heavy, heavy things. 
knowing that they need our prayers and God's comfort. Those who have lost loved ones, those who are sick and recovering, those who are caring for loved ones who are sick at home, those who are caring for persons in medical care, those who are separated from loved ones, those who are feeling alone and isolated, those who are helping and are so very tired, those who are struggling to find friends, food, and comfort, those who are afraid. God, we remember all those that we've named in our hearts and who we just mentioned. God, we carry hard, heavy things, but we know we do not carry them alone because you are with us. Just like the rock that has rolled away from Jesus' tomb, you are rolling away things from our lives to bring new life. Help us know you are bringing hope and joy and new possibilities. And let all God's people say, Amen. I miss meeting here in our beautiful sanctuary. We have such a gorgeous stained glass window and, with, and the organ and the symbols of our faith for the candles and the cross and the pe oh, the people. They're not here. Oh, well, I'm going to challenge you to create a worship sacred space in your house around where, where the computer would be sitting, and then you'd, you'd have these things that, that remind you of, G, of Jesus and of God. So I brought show and tell. I have my Bible, the Word of God. I have my devotional book, Jesus Calling, which is really the scriptures only Jesus is talking about. It. It's really cool. And it also has a journal in it. It's wonder. I really like that. And I have some other things here. I couldn't, I had, had trouble finding a candle. I have this one candle that has a butterfly on it, which is a symbol for the resurrection. And I found my uh, prayer beads. And so I'm going to have put that in my sacred space. And then I got to thinking, ah, God is also the, the creator. And so I happen to have this, this plant right here. This is a pansy plant. And it doesn't have any pansies showing right now because it's, I'm, I have to encourage it to have some buds. And so maybe putting in my sacred place some greens of some kind. My uh, lilac bushes are starting to bud. And so maybe next week I'll put a branch of that with my, with my sacred spot. Maybe you have uh, uh, silk flowers. So I'm going to stick that with the flowers here. So maybe give them an encouragement so they would start flowering. Now, what I'd like for you to do here is everybody in the family find something that is meaningful for you to put in this display and put the display in a place that you see it every day or all. And so I'm going to put mine on my kitchen table because that's where I usually have my devotions. And I want everybody to participate in creating this space. So if you live by yourself or you, there's twos of you or threes of you, or families, everybody should have some place, some bring something to it. Oh, I forgot to tell you about my angel. I collect angels um, and put them out only at Christmas time, except for this girl. She gets to stay out all the time. And the reason she stays out all the time is her hands are up, and it says joyful on here. And I'm thinking this workspace, this, this special worship place is going to be the just like here at church, that we worship and we praise God, just like she's doing. So I'll get her back. I'm hoping that maybe your family would take a picture of what your worship space looks like, and then you send it to the church, and we can include that in announcements or something and for show and tell, and keep this worship space all this whole season of after Easter. I want us to have a place to remember the awesomeness of God. Let's see if you remember. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Amen. Our theme for this series in Easter 
is celebrating from the book of Acts how the disciples ate their food with glad and generous hearts. And the challenge for us is to think about how we too can have those glad and generous hearts in these days. Think about the sights and the sounds and the words and all the actions that are part of your life. And think of them as a voice in your ear saying, peace be with it, peace be with you. And ask yourself, when have I felt peace this week? Or if you haven't experienced much peace this week, what do you have in your memory as something that brings you peace? This week I invite you to join us at our Wednesday or our Friday check-in times to connect with each other. And this week I'd like you to ponder as you come to that time how you might complete this sentence. I feel peace when... With glad hearts and rejoicing souls, let us sing God's praise, for we are Easter people. As we close this time together, remember God is always with you. You are not alone. No matter what you face, no matter what rocks or burdens you carry with you, no matter what, no matter what trials or hardships come your way, God is right beside you whispering, peace be with you, guiding you and directing your path. So do not live in fear, but enjoy. Take heart. This is the heart of the matter. Amen.